For those who don't know me, my name is Danny Postel. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at the University of Denver. On behalf of our center and also the Center for the Study of Europe and the World, which is a co-sponsoring body for today's discussion, welcome to this forum on the Charlie Hebdo debate, subtitled Islam, Europe, Freedom of Expression, and the Antinomies of Liberalism. This is a faculty forum with five professors from the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here at DU, whom I will introduce in just a moment. The horrific attacks on the French satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo and a kosher market in Paris just two weeks ago have sent shockwaves across Europe and the West more generally. An anti-Muslim backlash is growing, with right-wing populist parties mobilizing across Europe and acts of violence and vandalism against Muslim communities on the rise. These events have reignited smoldering cultural tensions and reopened talk of a civilizational war or a clash of civilizations between Islam and the West. But the Charlie Hebdo attacks are not isolated. They represent merely the most recent episode in a sequence of events stretching back over a decade, from the public assassination of the Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh in 2004 and the Danish cartoon controversy of 2006, to the French bans on wearing the hijab in public schools in 2004 and the niqab or burqa in any public space in 2010. Arguably, one could add to this list the 2005 riots in the French banlieue, or suburban ghettos of Paris, and, arguably, the ethnic racial unrest that exploded in the United Kingdom in 2011. Is there, in fact, an unbridgeable chasm between Islamic and liberal values? Are there limits to tolerance? Have European states failed to integrate Muslim migrants and their European-born children and grandchildren? Is it hypocritical for France to champion freedom of expression while arresting dozens on the vague charge of defending terrorism? Does liberalism offer a useful framework for making sense of these issues, or is it rather collapsing under the weight of its internal contradictions? In this forum this afternoon, we have five Corbell faculty members who will explore these questions and others in an open conversational format. There will be no prepared remarks, no speeches, no lectures, simply a conversation moderated by me. Our five speakers are Micheline Ishai, professor at DU's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, where she coordinates the Political Theory Forum, and she's also an affiliate faculty member, we're proud to say, of our Center for Middle East Studies. Her many books include The History of Human Rights, The Human Rights Reader, Internationalism and Its Betrayal, and The Nationalism Reader. She's currently working on a book about the Arab Spring and its aftermath. Micheline is really an ideal member of this panel discussion, being not only having those academic credentials I just mentioned, but being both Middle Eastern and European herself. Martin Rhodes is a professor of comparative political economy and the associate dean of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, where he also co-directs the Center for the Study of Europe and the World, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a co-sponsor of today's event. He's the co-editor of several books, among them Social Pacts in Europe, Emergence, Evolution, and Institutionalization, New Modes of Governance in Europe, and The Future of European Welfare, a New Social Contract? Question mark. Tom Ferrer is University Professor and former Dean of DU's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies and, we are proud to say, also an affiliate faculty member of our Center for Middle East Studies.
Tom is the former president of the University of New Mexico and of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. His most recent book is titled Confronting Global Terrorism and American Neoconservatism, the framework of a liberal grand strategy. Nader Hashimi is the director of our Center for Middle East Studies and an associate professor of Middle East and Islamic politics at DU's Joseph Corbell School for International Studies. He is the author of the very influential book, Islam, Secularism, and Liberal Democracy Toward a Democratic Theory for Muslim Societies. He's also the co-editor, with me, of The People Reloaded, The Green Movement and the Struggle for Iran's Future, and The Syria Dilemma. Alan Gilbert is John Evans Professor at the University of Denver's Corbell School of International Studies. His many books include Democratic Individuality, Must Global Politics Constrain Democracy? Question mark. And most recently, Black Patriots and Loyalists Fighting for Emancipation in the War for Independence. Alan blogs, as many of you know, or some of you may not, at Democratic Individuality. So I'm going to begin by posing, I have one question that I've prepared for each of my interlocutors, each of our panelists, a customized question for each of them. And I'm going to begin, and just one more word about the format, I will pose these questions one at a time to each of the panelists, but after their answer, any of the other panelists is welcome to jump in in a free-flowing conversational format. I might not get to all of these questions, depending on how that conversation goes. Let's just see. Martin, I'd like to start with you. Many observers are describing this as a dangerous moment for Europe. European governments are escalating security to fight terrorism. The patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the West, known by its acronym PEGIDA, held a mass rally in Dresden the other day. Both followers and opponents marched in other German cities. Of course, that organization's leader has now undergone something of a PR fiasco after photos of him posing as Adolf Hitler and a member of the Ku Klux Klan have surfaced on Facebook and he has withdrawn as leader of that organization. Nonetheless, these rallies across Europe against Muslim immigrants or against what the members of these groups call the Islamization of the West, these rallies are drawing huge crowds, but there are also counter rallies. There is um, a great divide in Europe today. Now, you, Martin, are a scholar of European political economy, and the New York Times columnist, Ross Duthat, made an interesting point the other day. It was either on CNN or MSNBC, and I immediately wondered what you would think of it. He said that the great irony here <clears throat> is that the economic policies that have pushed many Muslim and other immigrant communities in Europe to the margins that are creating what the French Prime Minister recently called a state of apartheid, spatial political apartheid in mm -hmm. Europe. Duhat's point was that the only political force in Europe today that is challenging and opposing these economic policies of the EU that are causing this marginalization are in fact, ironically, right-wing, populist, anti-immigrant, and specifically anti-Muslim uh, forces like the National Front in France. Marine Le Pen's party, which in fact is now poised to perhaps win the next election, largely because of recent events and this polarization caused by the Charlie Hebdo events um, and other related uh, episodes in the recent past. So my question to you, Martin, is do you agree with uh, Ross Duthat's observation, A, that these, the situation that we're facing with Muslim migrants, their marginalization, the anger and alienation that these, that mass unemployment and economic dislocation are causing, that these policies are A, 
the responsibility of mainstream EU policy at the moment? And B, do you agree that the only real force in Europe that's challenging these policies are these right-wing populist organizations and parties? How long have I got? Take a crack at it, but be brief. <clears throat> so, no, I, 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 well, because I want to contribute to some kind of debate, I'm going to say no, I don't agree with that at all. I figured you wouldn't. Um, <clears throat> I tell us a, why. It's a gross generalization. Okay, so the, the, the problem of um, poverty and marginalization in Europe is one that has been tackled by national governments and by the European Union together for some decades, and much more so than in the United States. There are explicit policies and expenditures to deal with that issue. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there's not poverty and that there's not inequality, but those levels of, po of poverty and inequality are much, much less severe than they are in the United States. Um, much less severe, and yet there remains a particular form of poverty and marginalization that seems to impact Muslim communities in major European cities disproportionately, no? No. I mean, I think if you look at the um, fate of um, many immigrants into the European Union in recent years, whether they're Muslim or not, um, and the fate of previous waves of immigration into European countries from e.g. the Caribbean into the United Kingdom, um, from the Indian subcontinent into the United Kingdom, uh, Chinese migration into many cities. There are many, many different communi communities who are affected. One should also say that people who are affected by high rates of unemployment across Europe also include um, people who simply are unable to the en enter the labor market because of lack of skills, education, and because of the way that you know, European employment works. I mean, there are many, many people who are unemployed. Spain has 25% unemployment overall, something like 45% unemployment across people under 25, including a great majority of Caucasian Spanish. And so if there's a problem, it goes way beyond the Muslim community. And in some respects, and in some places, Muslims are doing better than the average in terms of empl employment. And so to somehow equate this problem with a specific economic uh, problem affecting one group is, 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 is a gross generalization and doesn't help the debate at all. No, that's a useful um, point. And so it raises the obvious question then, if not then just the economic policies um, in the European Union today and the economic situation in Europe, then what is it, Alan Gilbert? Um, I agree very strongly with the thrust of Martin's remark. And one of the things about racism, including Orientalism or Islamophobia, is that it divides people up who are commonly hurt. The fact is that unemployment is a very serious thing in Europe, that there have been policies all the way through, although the disaster in Europe is a result of austerity, which, which Hollande unfortunately goes along with, and not really having a policy to put people to work. On the other hand, Arabs are 60 percent of the prisoners in French jails, and about less than 10 percent of the population. And I don't think you can deal with a figure like that unless you are willing to confront that there's very, very significant racism. Now, most people, particularly immigrants, find living in France better, as far as I can see. It's the second and third generation which have no chance up, in which a tiny number of people go in for depraved murders, including the ones we saw two weeks ago, and the murders in Toulouse. But I think that one part of the issue is to see both that what happens to people of Arab origin is not exclusively Arab, that the European community is not just ill-willed, and still 
that there's a very, very serious problem about the treatment of Arabs and Arab young people in the banlieue. This gets right to the core of things that both Micheline and Tom have addressed in great depth. And so I'm going to pose my question for you, Micheline. You grew up reading Charlie Hebdo. Um, I think most Americans, most people outside of France had not heard of this magazine, certainly weren't familiar with its content before the horrific events of two weeks ago. Now, France uh, is doing a great deal of soul searching at the moment, Micheline. Um, more than three million people poured into the streets, not just in Paris, but across France in uh, this solidarity march just the other day, holding signs saying, Je suis Charlie Hebdo and affirming the values of freedom of expression um, and civil liberties. On the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, the French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, has said that France must address what he called territorial, social, and ethnic apartheid to deal with the alienation, the alienation and marginalization of Muslim communities that we've just been talking about. And so my question to you is, what's going on here? What is this soul searching going on in France today really about? And does it raise fundamental questions, as some have argued, about the French model of secularism and multiculturalism? Okay. So I think that the events of Charlie Hebdo, the, the attack of 12, I mean, that led to the killing of 12 uh, cartoonists and people in Charlie Hebdo and the unfolding events is really a reflection of more than one narrative that can be seen uh, in the demonstrations that you depicted. So one of the narrative uh, that, I, that came out was uh, one which is connected to an interesting part of history of France. Uh, and that is the one that began in the late 19th century uh, with the Dreyfus Affair and so the rise of a very strong anti-Semitism that led to the development of the collaborationist regimes of General Pétain. So that, the, the moment where we saw Je suis Charlie, but there was also Je suis Yohav, et cetera, that sort of that level of anti-Semitism is part of the historical narrative of France and uh, was what we also saw in uh, the demonstration. But there is a, another narrative that is also very poignant uh, in those demonstrations, and it's the history of France, the history that led to 130 years of occupations in Algeria, uh, and ultimately ended up with, and that's an understatement, to a mismanaged uh, colonial occupations of uh, Algeria, and uh, resulted in to, to a brutal end of, uh, to a civil war and also a war of, of decolonizations, uh, that ended in the, the late 50s. Subsequent to that, we've seen sort of a great part of the Maghrebian populations emigrating north to France uh, and in North Africa, creating perhaps, um, and, and, and sort of I would go back to the comments of Martin Rhodes here, I, I just perhaps not creating just a, a sort of a lumpen proletariat or a, a proletarian populations in those banlieues that you're re referring to, but nonetheless, uh, significant portions of the population have not been always successfully integrated in the French economy, and that creates a problem and spaces for radicalization that we've seen in the 19th arrondissement uh, with uh, the rise of two uh, brothers who uh, took on their hands to avenge what they per perceived to be um, uh, an insult against Islam. So this is a, a second narrative that is connected to those demonstrations that is important to, to keep in mind. And then there is a third narrative, which I think is, is an important one. It's the one that of the editors of Charlie Hebdo and who they represent. You mentioned that I was reading Charlie Hebdo. I was very young and there was, it, it's sort of a cater for an adult audience, so of course I would read Charlie Hebdo. Um, <laughs> and of course I would read Canard Enchaîné because it's very uh, it's insulting and when you're a rebellious teenager you want to read all this stuff and it's great. But there is something that really is deep into who are the editors of Charlie Hebdo and, and to me they represent uh, another France. And that's the France of 1789. 
that's the friends, the Jacobin friends of the declarations of universal rights uh, uh, and um, the declarations of men and the citizen of 1789. They, they were essentially, for those who know actually their politics, uh, anti-racist, anti-sexist, um, anti-Islamophobic, anti-anti-Semitic. Uh, so in, in fact, they were representative of sort of the Republican ideals of, of that, that self-79 so that also traveled throughout a long history that France uh, has um, experienced. And this is the one that also was sort of a magnet point for the, the demonstrations in the Charlie Je suis Charlie. Now, many people, and I want just to, to, to add a couple of things. Many people suggest that you, you have to be for Charlie, at least those who have had those signs, because it, it's sort of the France of Voltaire. You know, you fight for the positions and the value that you don't agree with. This is part of what we know to be our democracy today. But there is something deeper uh, with respect to the positions that the editor of Charlie Hebdo appelled, it, it was sort of a substantive argument about what rights are. They, they, they were fighting, first and foremost, from all forms of fanatism, all kinds of fanatism. And what they did is in the traditions that the French know very well, is that you push excess to its absolute log logical absurdity, to its absurdity. So you, you would take images of racism, and, and you would just, that racists have about black or Jews or, or Muslim, and then you would just push that contradiction and explore uh, the, you know, as a result the contradiction by doing so. So it's not a, a, an adherence to or subscription to those uh, racist slurs, but it's rather the opposite. And they do, the French do that, and they have a long, long history of political satire dating and can be traced to Molière in the Precieuse Ridicule when he, Molière himself go to the monarchs in the courts and just actually mimic and mock them by just making them even more ridiculed by accentuating their excess. And he does it too in front of the power to be, you see. So that's Molière, this is Daumier, this is the French Revolution cartoonist. And so they represent that long tradition. It's not something that just simply happened in 68, although they are the Charlie Hebdo editors, members of the 68 social movement, but it's something sort of much more, and, and, and it's often lost in translations and those who have actually subsequently had held the Je ne suis pas Charlie, uh, um, uh, sign of forgot and probably unfortunately could not always read those cartoons in the context and the political discourse in which they were evolving. So a lot of those cartoons were lost in translation. Uh, political cartoon needs to be understood in the political context. Even humor, satire has to be understood. If you enter a debate without knowing what's going on, you actually do not understand who is impersonating whom. So that, that's part of the, the problem that was lost in translation and unfortunate uh, become a symbol for the radicalizations for um, jihadists uh, who have went against definitely the wrong people. That's a useful cultural and intellectual history <laughs> of where the Charlie Hebdo cartoons uh, come from, uh, Michelin. Both Nader and Martin would like to jump in, though. Nader? Uh, well, speaking of uh, different narratives, there is a different narrative on Charlie Hebdo that um, argues that post 9-11, it took a decidedly and a very um, a purposeful sort of um, orientation toward uh, targeting Arab and Muslim immigrants in, in France and that its earlier manifestation in terms of pushing sort of the boundaries uh, had a decidedly Islamophobic sort of orientation. And this is not coming from just myself, but there was a, an op-ed that was published in Le Monde about a, a month before the, the massacres in Paris by a former uh, journalist there, Olivia Seyran, who, you know, said he had to quit because he just couldn't take anymore the obsessive sort of picking on marginalized and economically sort of um, um, discriminated against immigrants. In other words, this person was from the staff of Charlie Hebdo. Exactly. And so he sort of, you know, went through some of the things that he found objectionable. Now, I haven't read it, and I suspect because of what happened, there's going to be um, people who are going to do studies that will do a content analysis of seeing just to what extent they were equal opportunity offenders and to what extent they were actually picking on Arab and Muslim immigrants. But for example, one image that he sort of uh, mentions that really he found objectionable was this image. And pardon my language, but I'm, I'm quoting from the journalist here who said that he was just deeply offended by Charlie Hebdo putting on his front cover an image of a, uh, um, a Muslim imam um, screwing a goat with the caption, 
um, we'd like to share with you our cultural traditions. Um, um, now, if Charlie Hebdo was doing that equally to, um, for example, the Jewish community in France, uh, then one, one could say, okay, well, there's an equal opportunity. They're just offending everyone. They don't care. But, but from the reports that I've read, there was a decided sort of shift in that magazine to picking on Arab and Muslim immigrants. And that makes perfect sense if you sort of understand the political context of France and its struggles with its own identity and its own uh, attempt to reconcile its uh, conception of religion-state relations with the fact that you have a multicultural society in your midst. And the French have a very difficult time with hyphenated identities. In many ways, this, this debate about um, Muslim immigrants in France goes back to 1989 when um, French society, you know, was was in a massive debate. A huge convulsion and uh, sort of political explosion happened when a group of um, uh, young Muslim girls decided to wear the hijab. Or they're wearing the hijab. They're going to public school, and and that unleashed a major debate on secularism. In fact, they had to rewrite the constitution to deal with that particular threat. And the vast majority of French people who weighed in on the topic um, agreed with this question of you know banning the religious public display of of, of a certain identity in in the public sphere. Um, so the, the Charlie Hebdo's um, um, sort of portrayal and caricatures of uh, and its 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 right to defend offend uh, different community religious sensibilities and political sensibilities. I think one has to um, one has to sort of judge it and um, one has to sort of ask: Was it an equal opportunity offender? Was it deliberately picking on sort of a certain community that um, that? has been a huge sort of unresolved issue in terms of where do they fit into the French Republic? Can you have hyphenated identities? And, and, and this is part of the, I think, narrative and the story that has to be, I think, part of our uh, larger discussion. Martin? <clears throat> I just, yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, for, for an American audience, it might be a little bit hard to understand the scurrilous and flagrantly sometimes abusive nature of the satire that comes out of an, a, a, a magazine, a paper like Charlie Hebdo. I mean, Sh Simon Shamer, the historian and, and broadcaster, wrote recently that you know, the biggest threat to American democracy, apart from money, is reverence. Hmm. That is um, an inability to poke fun at politicians, an inability on the part of p politicians themselves to accept that kind of criticism. In fact, the absence, apart from some very kind of mild, humorous satire on things like uh, the, t the, the Tonight Show and so on. I mean, The Daily Show. The Daily Show. Uh, now The Nightly Show, whatever. <laughs> um, is nothing compared to the satire in the British television program, um, Spitting Image, hmm. that had Margaret Thatcher dressed in a pinstripe suit, suit always urinating in the men's lavatory. <laughs> Um, this is John. John Boehner is never subjected to the same kind of ridicule in any form in the United States, and so this is a, this is a European tradition which is very strong. And and ridicule of people in power or ridicule of people who assume to take a position which contravenes the accepted constitutional rights to free speech and autonomy and so on. Is, is simply a very well-established tradition. And you know, it raises the question, I mean, I, I, Nader may be, you know, it may be co correct to say that um, focusing on a marginal group um, in a society which is not successfully multicultural is a liberty that satire shouldn't take. Well, this, but, yeah. you know, but, but, at the, but at the same time, I think, you know, one has to ask the question of whether a, a group in a society, amongst whom there are people who say that religious laws supersede the constitutional or national laws, should be immune to criticism. Well, this raises, I think, questions about the contradictory impulses of liberalism. So I want to pose my next question to Tom Ferrer, who has written on this very topic um, at some length. And I've circulated this piece uh, that came out in Salon over the weekend, a very thoughtful, I thought, um, article called The Left's Charlie Hebdo Dilemma, in which the author, with whom I was not familiar, uh, made the point that there are, there are different principles and values in liberalism, 
that come into conflict here, right? On the one hand, and we've just identified them in this last piece of the discussion. On the one hand, the ones that Michelin outlined going back to 1789, the values of freedom of expression, irreverence, um, um, contempt for authority, certainly arbitrary authority, and specifically in the European context, a, an anti-religious impulse. Um, these are uh, a, a central to the liberal intellectual tradition. On the other hand, there are other values central to the liberal tradition, values of tolerance, of um, pluralism, of respect for difference, and fighting for the underdog. And so, Tom, uh, in 2013, you delivered the university lecture here at DU titled The Clash of Cultures, the tension within liberalism and the proper limits of tolerance. It was as if you had prefigured um, the debate taking place today over Charlie Hebdo and related matters, Tom. But this tension within liberalism that you identified seems to be playing out very much right now. And I'd like you to talk about, because I know you have a very pragmatic um, angle on this entire question as well. So if you would, walk us through th this question of how liberalism's conflicting or competing impulses really play out in this debate. And what specifically, from a policy point of view, Tom, would you like to see happen? How can we even address this from a policy perspective? Liberalism, in its essence, I argued in my piece, and I still think, is is focused on the individual and on the opportunity of individuals to create themselves and recreate themselves. But of course, individuals don't exist outside of a social context. Individuals have have identities with other individuals. They may be religious identities, they may be ethnic identities, they may be racial identities. And so how an individual thinks, of course some individuals think they're merely cosmopolitan, that they don't, that their only identity is with humanity in general. But most of, most people, most of us, have a sense of ourselves, but we also have a sense of ourselves as part of some community, or of many communities, a number of communities, a local community, the nation, we may have a strong sense of nationalism, or we may have a very strong sense of religious identity. We're a creative individual, but we're also a Catholic, or a Muslim, or, or a Buddhist, or whatever. So my, where I'm leading is, if you, if you have a strong sense of identity with a community which is disparaged, or which you see as regularly humiliated, then that can affect your own ability to feel, to feel good about yourself. You feel humiliated by the humiliation of the wider group. So, well, on the one hand, you could say liberalism should lead to absolutist views about freedom of speech. Um, and in the U.S., which is at, in, in terms of limits on speech, the U.S. is at one end of a vast continuum. That is, there are almost no limits on freedom of speech in the United States. And the decisions of the Supreme Court interpreting the First and Fourteenth Amendments have establish uh, that anything goes as far as freedom of speech, except crying fire in a crowded theater. So, uh, well, your, most European countries have legislation ag against uh, racist speech, and they define it differently in different countries. But clearly in Europe, there is a sense there, there are limits to, to speech and that speech which provokes hostility and tolerance of a group uh, ought to be limited. And yet they still think of themselves, or many of those who support these limits, as liberal. And indeed, the most important international human rights treaty, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, makes it an obligation of states to adopt 
legislation against hate speech, or not just speech, but primarily uh, <coughs> publications which lead to hatred of ethnic, religious, or national groups. So I think that's probably the tension that you have in mind that I spoke about before, this tension between focusing exclusively on the individual and recognize that in order to, in order to help individuals to realize themselves, to realize the potential for self-development, for creativity, a concern for, the, for their wider identity is legitimate. Does that, does that make sense to you, Daniel? It does. Alan, you wanted to jump in? Um, I strongly agree with Tom's analysis, which I won't give you my own version about. But basically, if you want to defend the equal liberty of each person, then I'm afraid lynching and the incitement of it aren't on. And as the Europeans recognize, um, affirming Nazism and anti-Semitism in that form are not on. Now, the issue in France is France held Algeria as part of itself, but I disagree with Micheline that there is a mismanaged colonialism in the sense that I think colonialism is evil. I think colonialism as a project is a disaster. And what Algeria produced was civil war in France, which includes the emergence of the French right. So the National Front, run by Monsieur Le Pen, was actually the National Front for French Algeria. And uh, the immigrants who came from North Africa had been traumatized, brutalized by the French. So here at the University of Denver, we have just issued a report, which I was a member of, on John Evans and his role in the Sand Creek Massacre. And behind that lies the genocide across the country. And the governor at the healing march actually apologized for the massacre to the descendants of the Cheyennes and Arapahoes. Now I think and I really would like to praise Monsieur Val for saying this, especially given his history as something of a racist. Um, this situation of apartheid toward large numbers of people who would happily integrate in France if they were treated decently, but have trouble if they are left out in the cold and harassed by the police and shoved into jail in the way I mentioned and so on, is a very big point. And I think that one of the steps that needs to come, and it's not going to be an easy one, is actually to say that what France did in Algeria, however you want to characterize it, is such a harm, and racism is such a harm, <laughs> that even anti-racist generally, and I'll just speak of Sharp, he did a satiric cartoon on the Ten Commandments in Israel and the soldiers shooting an old woman, an old Palestinian woman in 2009. So the accusation that they're just racist is false. But if you attack the weak, if you satirize the weak in this context, I'm afraid that it's, it's a pretty brutal thing. And I want to say again, by the way, that what was done there was unspeakable, right? Do you think so it should be illegal? What? To satirize the weak. Uh, personally, um, I think that it should be, that there should be, when there are longstanding acts of racism, there should be, strictures about it. I'm not sure whether I want to get into what should be legal and what not. I prefer debate and freedom of speech. All I would say is about it. In France, what you have, and in America, is Orientalism and Islamophobia. So badly, by the way, that Boner feels they'll like he can steal a march by inviting Netanyahu so we can have a war in Iran. Right? 
I mean, it's real serious here. People think they can get great political advantage this morning by doing this kind of thing and attacking Obama and inviting Netanyahu here to further war. And I guess one last point about it is this. What radicalized the Kawachi brothers was watching films of Abu Ghraib. That's what the guy Ben Yatu showed them when he wanted to convince them. He said, Abu Ghraib and this invasion in the Middle East. And the idea that the West making war over and over again and using its force in the Middle East is a good thing, actually is one of the great disasters of our time and follows for us on the perils of French colonialism in Algeria and handling this crisis, which it really is, and may produce French for, France for the French and Marine Le Pen in the 2017 election, unless we're very lucky. And it's right here. Tom Ferrer, quickly. I think Alan has usefully opened up a larger issue. First of all, we've only been talking about France. But it's not only young people from France who are going off to fight in Syria or Iraq. And it's not only in France that there have been outrageous killings of people on the basis of killing of people on the basis in the name of, of Islam. So it's it's a wider problem than the French problem. France is peculiar in its relationship to North Africa. It's true because of the occupation, the Algerian war, the collaboration between the Algerian government and authoritarian governments in Morocco and Tunisia uh, for many years and the French government. But, but the problem isn't unique to, to France. And Martin began the discussion in pointing out that not all the poor people, not all the poor young people in Europe are Islamic. That there are legacy Europeans who are also poor and live in, in, uh, in, dis in difficult circumstances. So the, the intriguing question and the very unresolved question is if the, if the condition of second and third generation people of Muslim heritage in France and in perhaps in other parts of Europe, but certainly in France, is similar to the condition of African Americans, Americans in American ghettos. What has resulted in the politicization of some segment, we don't know how large a segment, it may be quite a small segment, but some segment of the sec of second and third generation Europeans of Islamic heritage, why, why have they acquired an Islamic identity rather than a national identity? <coughs> this is part of the part of the question of why this particular form of politicization, which in turn leads, in a small number of cases but a significant number of cases, to ultimate acts of, of violence or potential violence. That, that it seems to me, is the, is the, from a policy point of view, is the more important question and the very most difficult question. And none of us have really even begun to answer that question so far today. Well, that's a very good segue because the question I had prepared for Nader Hashimi was exactly on this point. Nader, you have argued that what's happening in Europe today is principally not about Europe, but actually about the politics of the Middle East. Explain how exactly that is so and why it matters. Um, you know, Tom's framing of the question is, I think, a really good one because it, it, it helps focus our attention on the question of the political ideas that have informed this particular violent act. Where are they coming from and why are they manifesting themselves and capturing the imagination of a certain segment of um, in this case, European immigrant populations now, as opposed to previous moments in time. And I think um, the, the, the explanation, as far as I understand it, is that um, we are now seeing the predictable uh, consequences of, uh, broadly speaking, the broken politics of the Middle East, uh, corrupting and um, shaping the political consciousness of uh, 
um, some young people with a Muslim identity. But more specifically, I think the political ideas um, or the political theology that justifies in the name of some sort of higher moral good, the killing of others, the killing of people who are uh, different than yourselves, the killing of, uh, of Jews, of cartoonists, of non-Muslims, of Sufi Muslims, of, of uh, Shia Muslims. That um, political theology is coming out of the politics of one particular country in the Middle East, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The mainstreaming of Wahhabi Islam, um, buttressed by the sale of um, oil, um, um, infused by billions of dollars in disseminating this particular ultra-conservative and puritanical, retrograde, intolerant form of Islam has uh, begun to take shape and influence mainstream Muslim communities in the latter half of the 20th century. I'm old enough to uh, remember at least what immigrant Muslim communities in Canada were like when I was growing up in the 70s. I saw the shift take place. The shift takes place after 1979. If you look at the debates, you look at the um, the, the behaviors of, of Muslim societies, not just immigrant ones, but even within the, the, the Arab Islamic world in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, it was a much more tolerant, much more open uh, place than it is today. And the, the, the fueling of this particular polit political ideology is deeply connected to the mainstreaming of, um, of this particular interpretation of Islam. And so you have young Muslim immigrants uh, without a sense of history just going, growing up in a particular part of the world. And the only Islam that they hear and that they're exposed to is this particular ultra-conservative, ugly version. And they think it's authentic and, and normative. And um, I think that largely explains um, um, uh, what's happening here. And now this is not exclusively a Saudi Wahhabi phenomenon, but it largely is. There are manifestations or similarities of this within the world of Shia Islam. But with respect to the events in Paris, in, um, uh, in, in England, and in other parts of the, um, of the Islamic world, there is a deep connection. And of course, the, the other theme that I hinted at in, in, in my initial comments, the broken politics of the Middle East, the, the persistence of political tyranny, authoritarianism, despotism, um, um, of which you know, we had some hope that four years ago at this time, the Arab Spring would perhaps start to you know, um, uh, change uh, that uh, landscape. Um, uh, has not produced the outcomes that we hoped, and it has furthered this particular sort of narrative and drawn a lot of young people. And we were sort of exposed to this particular phenomenon on 9-11, because if you remember 9-11, 15 out of the 19 hijackers came from one country, Saudi Arabia. That's not a fluke. That's not a, uh, an accident. That suggests something deeply problematic and toxic within the kingdom of Saudi Arabia that we, we can't ignore and that we shouldn't ignore. Now, there's other many dimensions to this particular phenomenon, but I think broadly speaking, this is a big part of the problem that we're facing. And in a globalized world, ideas spread. And these particular ideas have spread to immigrant communities and affected the hearts and minds, unfortunately, of some young people who are acting out radically informed by this particular vision. Micheline? I saw your hand up. Did you want to respond? Uh, or, or, briefly, or I, I was going to respond to more than one person. Um, yes, I, I think that uh, there is a particular interesting timing as to what happens today, and even so the Danish cartoon, but certainly today. I, I would add to your narrative and to your explanations, another that the, the economic recessions of 2008 has created a uh, major social malaise throughout Europe, just sort of going in you know, message with, with what Martin was saying. We saw the rise of the, Russian, the national rights in most countries, many countries in Europe, from Germany to Greece, and, uh, the, and, and racism and Islamophobia as a result of that has been heightened and is becoming a serious problem that needs to be addressed. Um, but the question here, and that's an interesting question for the rest of the panel, how do you address a problem such as this, so the radical right and also uh, the distressed um, Muslim population? Um, I would like to simply suggest and sort of in response first to what Nada was saying that, um, and I don't know if it's just another, but I would like to suggest that uh, when we make an argument for universal rights, it's, it's very important not to feel that we're offending groups. And that's probably, I will deviate from what you're saying, Tom. I, I think that the political sensibility is important and one should not want to converge oneself with and how this, the, the positions of the rights, human rights, Republican ideas of friends could be capitalized by a nationalist party. I understand that that's important, but nonetheless, one has to be clear as to what is fought against. So if, for instance, Islamic, Islamist 
uh, imagery are invoked in order to suppress the rights of women, or ultra-Orthodox uh, imagery are used in order to oppress uh, Palestinians in Gaza, or uh, the Pope is used in order to suggest that you know we need perhaps have to have contraceptions and so forth. Those are, in my opinion, uh, fair games in democracy. They should never be prohibited and never be censored. Uh, we have to be very clear as to there are other groups, competing groups that you, you one may offend. Women's, gays, uh, and other form of minorities. And so I think that we have to be clear, regardless of where it comes from, which group it comes from, that so those values, those core values, have to be upheld in a very clear sort of categorical, I'm using sort of a Kantian way of thinking about this, categorically way of just, in, just making sure that those positions are not compromised because they can be easily compromised. Then when we talk about the response, then it's important to make a distinction about, okay, now we are not, you know, the more progressive and liberal people who are actually wanting to see a better Europe, a better France, do not march side by side with sort of more exclusionary, marginalizing uh, sections of the populations, uh, not with Marie Le Pen and not with others of that sort. And that, that has to be also clearly specified. I don't think that we can merge those two positions just to make sure that we are not offending possibly um, an Islamist imam who might have problems with uh, the rights of women. I, I just particularly don't care. I think we should just simply say. Actually, by the way, if I can say it anecdotally, there's an interesting Charlie Hebdo with three um, uh, members, three members of uh, three monothe the three monotheistic religion. There was a rabbi and a pope, and uh, and a prophet, and they each had a woman in front of them, and each of those women were veiled. And it was really satirical in the sense that they were just said that they only can present women as long as they veil them. It was a, an effort not to go against those religion, but an effort to go against the specific part of individuals in those religions which con who condemned the rights of women. And when there, there has been cartoon also about the, um, I don't know if you remember this, where uh, Charlie Hebdo kissed uh, an, uh, a Muslim man. A lot of people found it sort of tasteless and, and exaggerated and excessive. If, in the political context of the time, they were, uh, the people of Charlie Hebdo were questioning, uh, first of all, the gay bashing that exists by certain element of Islam, not all of them, but certain amount of Islam would just sort of suppress gay rights, and they were at the same time contesting what the French did by banning the legislations on gay. <coughs> so they were doing a sort of a double take on, on this particular situation. So, of course, if you look at, at, at the cartooning of itself, you won't get it, but this is really what was the, under t the, the subtext of the thing. So what I'm trying to suggest here sort of briefly is that certain value cannot be compromised, even in social democracy, needs to be upheld. Of course, there needs to be a great sensitivity to people who have been marginalized, weakened. Uh, but, but I think by, there is a way to bring them in the conversation by just suggesting that it's not because they, be, they belong to a specific group that they will not be condemning certain um, uh, the rights of women or gay and so forth. I think there's a specific way to do that, and so that's what I would like to add. Martin, was there in fact uh, hypocrisy involved in France having um, Saudi Arabia represented in the Charlie Hebdo march simultaneously Saudi Arabia, while Saudi Arabia was simultaneously engaged in flogging a, an imprisoned blogger for uh, insult, insulting Islam for having a blog called Liter Liberal Saudi Arabians. You mean, were they wrong to invite? <clears throat> were they wrong to invite, and does the presence of Saudi Arabia in Paris at that march simply highlight the contradictions and hypocrisy of the West affirming these values while embracing regimes that crush them? That, that wasn't what I wanted to talk about next, but... Fair enough. I, I, I don't... I, Feel free to I deflect. Think, I, th I think in, a, in a, a liberal and democratic society, you're better off having people there than not there in this. I mean, banning whoever I mean, is, is a bad idea. In, in, the, in Britain, banning Jewish academics from visiting Britain has been a serious policy plank 
of the University Lecturers Association. It's a very, very bad idea in a democracy. Similarly, to exclude Saudi Arabia for what it's doing at home is a bad idea. I don't think banning that helps anything, but dialogue usually does. I mean, it's a very sensitive issue, and you know, I don't have a hard view on it, but that's my in instinctive response. No, I just, I just wanted to say <coughs> something vis-a-vis uh, -vis what Alan and Micheline were saying. I mean, I, I think Micheline made a marvelous statement. What she does, she, I absolutely support her position on something should not be sacrosanct in a liberal society. I want to say something about what um, Alan was... So I don't want people here to be left with the impression that racism is a massive problem in European society and that... That it isn't. That you it, don't want them to have the impression that it isn't a massive problem. I don't want to think that there's either a war between Islam and European liberalism because of, a, of, of certain incidents by people who are inspired by a particular version of Islam. I don't want people to think that uh, racism across the board is a bigger problem in Europe than elsewhere. Um, one should remember that um, the rise of racist parties in Europe from the 1970s onwards, including the National Front, has always provoked a much bigger counter attack. So SOS Racisme in France, Rock Against Racism in Britain, these large movements, very popular amongst young people, um, were a powerful counterforce to the attempts of um, nationalist, populist, right-wing parties to use racism as a platform. And as a result, you still have some very nasty parties around in Europe on the right-wing fringe, but they base these days they don't make electoral gains by being racist they make electoral gains by being populist on a whole bunch of other issues and the main reason why the national front gets votes or the true Finns get votes and so on and the Dan the, the the danish Dem the democrats all right-wing parties is because they're exploiting traditional conservative issues that other parties are relegating so you know prote protecting uh, the status quo of welfare benefits, very appealing to old people in, in, in particular, um, opposing liberalization of labor markets, very popular amongst people in trade unions. So they're trying to be very status quo oriented in building support. Racism has receded, I'm not denying it's not still there, amongst those particular fringe parties, but it's not as if it's at the core of the European party system, and it's not as if racism is at the core of European voters and, and their behavior. People will try to exploit Charlie Hebdo and other events in order to create that connection. But I think the show of unity that we saw in France in the streets, which, you know, mass and, and Marine Le Pen isn't even present in that kind of show manifestation of sympathy across cultural divides, shows us that there's something very strong in Europe that will prevent this from spilling over and creating this dangerous moment that um, the New York Times correspondent was talking about. Also, it's worth noting that Pegida, so the, the Ger East Germany is a an interesting place. Huh. The former East Dres Germany. Dresden and Leipzig and these very large demonstrations by East Germans is also a manifestation of something more than just racism. But racism is a particular problem in Eastern Germany because Eastern Germ Germany and its population were never denazified. The I, you know, culture, political correctness, but more importantly, anti-Nazism and racism were not eradicated from the mindset of East Europeans in the same way as it was done in, in, in West Germany. I think it's no coincidence. That's a good point. That's a good point. That, no coincidence that these really big marches are taking place in East Germany. You don't see that as principally an economic issue, that I East think Germany I, has lagged economically behind the rest of Germany. No, I think that, you know, there, there's lots of nostalgia among some people for the old East Germany, and there's lots of discontent um, in East Germany because of economic, the economic situation. But this, this anti-Islamization thing is specifically about the so-called Islamization of Europe and the fact that it picks up so much support from people who in other places would never dare to articulate that view, even if they held it.
I think, says something about uh, East Germany politically and culturally. Uh, Nader, did you want to jump in on Well, you know, I, I do, but I also want to give the audience a chance to weigh in because we... we um, yeah, let's do a sound a time, check here. Time limit. We are at 1.05 p.m., and I want to make two quick housekeeping announcements, very brief. One is that the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies has a town hall meeting, uh, which our dean, Ambassador Christopher Hill, will preside over. That's in Charrington Hall in the Cyber Cafe in its traditional location. That's at 1.15 today. So I know a lot of folks here are not from the Joseph Corbell School, so this doesn't concern you. But for those who do intend to attend that meeting, um, it will start in 10 minutes. And um, please do uh, please do attend that meeting. Uh, the other announcement I want to make is that our Center for Middle East Studies has actually compiled a, res a set of resources. Um, basically, Nader and I and, uh, and our colleague Doug Garrison reading through what we consider the most thoughtful and probing essays and think pieces about this very debate that we're having today. We've compiled them all in a one-stop shop on our website. So if you just want to go to our website, they're there. We've called it like the Charlie Hebdo debate, Islam, tolerance and, liberation, and liberalism. It's on our website, um, du.edu slash Corbell slash Middle East, but just Google it, you'll find it. Um, I think Nader is exactly right. I know the panelists have more to say, but let's hear from the audience, and then we'll, in turn we'll hear more from the panelists. Go ahead and take the microphone right here if you have a question. You can line up. You're, you feel free to identify yourself um, or not, and uh, address your question, please, to a specific panelist. Um, if your question is, in fact, for a specific panelist or to the panel in general, and we'll see who might want to weigh in. So no takers yet. So very good. Why don't we go back then? Aha! Very good. Hi. So I'm Frederic. I'm a French uh, teacher here at the Is that microphone on, Sean? <coughs> oh, there we yes. go. Yes. There. yes. Very good. Thank you. Please. So, uh, Say, identify yourself so again. I, I'll do it again. My name is Frederic Chevillot. I'm just a little bit French. <laughs> and uh, I do teach French here at DU, I've done that for a number of years. Uh, my students are here, and uh, we've been talking a lot about this notion of re republicanism, la République française, and the notion of anti-communitarism. And I'd like the panel to sort of clarify for us what that means, because a republic has some very positive connotations, but from the American perspective, anti-communitarism, that is, you know, we're not going to let the Muslim community or the gay community or the specific uh, communities. Uh, you know, Caribbean community celebrate their history or their culture. That's my question. Merci. Okay. Uh, Micheline or Tom, I think uh, either of you might uh, want to respond to that or both. Okay. The discussion reminds me a bit of, uh, of a distinction that Stanley Fish does when he talks about boutique multiculturalism and, or liberalism and the core values liberalism. So in the political spectrum, you could say on the one hand that the French focus more on the core values of multiculturalism, if we can talk about this way. They insist on certain value that needs to, can, that cannot be transgressed and challenged and contested. But at the same time, there is, it coexists with the understanding that there is a boutique multiculturalism in the sense that you would um, celebrate uh, different cultures as long as they do not encroach with those core values that come from the Republican ideas of the French revolutions. With the, with the American context, it's slightly different. There is a sense of communitarian coexistence. I don't really believe in what you are saying. I, I really think that you're transgressing a little bit. Yes, we are going to allow the KKK to march, but as long as it's not really threatened the American society. So there is a, a, a broader understanding of what the com of course, I, I don't want to suggest that uh, communitarianism is only impl uh, implicates that you can march, uh, that the KKK can march, but there is sort of a greater coexistence perhaps about different communities, uh, and perhaps the notions of core value is more eclipsed in, in, that, in that particular sense. So I don't know if that provides an, an answer to your students, but maybe and, others uh, want to I jump think in. Tom, Martin, Nodder. Uh, Tom, did you want to respond to that? Yeah. Well, I. I wasn't entirely sure where you wanted us to go when, in raising the question. One issue we haven't really examined, which is relevant to the larger discussion, 
is how different European countries have, at least in theory, approached the reality of distinct cultural communities developing within the national frontiers. So the, the British have traditionally taken the position, which is sometimes called multiculturalism, but although multiculturalism means different things to different people, and it's, I won't say, I don't want to use the word extreme, but I can't think of another word at the moment, so that it, at one extreme is the view that within the, within the nation, let's say Britain, each cultural community should be free to sustain its legacy culture. And if that involves patrimonialism, if it involves arranged marriages, uh, that's all right. As long as the right of exit remains, someone can leave that community if they want to, there should not be an organized effort by the national government to impose a, a secular liberal agenda on the different populations. And France has usually been seen as the other end of this continuum, seeking to achieve not simply uh, agreement on basic constitutional principles, which is sort of a minimal integrationist approach, but actually achieving a sim cultural assimilation so that your first identity will be French and you'll accept the, all of the important values of what in France would be Republic, Republican tradition, we would say the liberal mm -hmm. tradition. But I think in, so that in the last several years, most of the heads of states have excoriated multiculturalism. I think in the last two years, you may have noticed that different heads of state, prime ministers, presidents in Europe have said, multiculturalism is dead, it's proven and, the, exam, and the, the consequence of multiculturalism are these occasional acts of, of terrorism. Uh, and Tom, the formal ideal, the formal French ideal, is of, if you will, maximalist assimilation to the values of French republicanism and secularism, as you just pointed out. But the lived reality is something quite different, isn't it? And maybe this is where we can bleed into your comments, Martin. I mean, the, the, act, the actual reality, at least according to the critics and many uh, Muslim communities, uh, is yes, uh, they want us to be French, but they don't allow us to be French. Second, third generation Algerian, uh, French born uh, uh, Al of Algerian descent who have never been to Algeria, don't speak Arabic, they're not considered French in, in, uh, by you. They may legally be, but not existentially or culturally. Doesn't that, isn't that in fact a contradiction? Well, um, I would say that not just France, but every European country and many nations around the world beyond Europe struggle with this problem of, or this, this dilemma. Do, you, do, we, do we want integration? Or, or do we want multi, multiculturalism? And Tom is right that multiculturalism has, has gotten a bad name recently. But, and, and some countries, uh, for example, the, the Netherlands, go through a very, very clear immigration process where people are shown pictures of topless women and so on and to say this isn't normal in our society. Get used to it. Um, but you know, no one, no one has, has a solution for groups that, to some extent, are self-isolating. So, for example, when I when I when I um, I lived in the centre of Manchester at one time, and uh, in that area, many different uh, migrant communities were living, and many of most 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 of them, I mean, many of them had a whole bunch of poor people. Some were ghettoized to some extent, but the groups that were least able to um, a culturally, let's say, engage with the society into which they they immigrated, were probably the Muslim groups, the, the people. From, so the people from Pakistan, the re religious people from Pakistan, were much less able to make this cultural compromise than people from elsewhere in the Indi Indian subcontinent. And there are various reasons. Um, women not being allowed to, to have jobs or enter the community. Sometime, in some cases, decades after migrating to the country, women unable to speak English because they were unable 
because of the um, patriarchal structure of the family to engage with the community around them. So, you know, I think there are some some you know, very obvious contradictions and no country has really found a solution to that problem. And to the extent that that kind of social isolation goes along sometimes with, with religious fundamentalism, it, it obviously creates the potential for some communities to be more isolated, more marginalized than others, which is not just the result of racism in the society, but also of the way that group... The internal logic. React, re ...reacts and transacts with the, with, the, with the society around it. And, you know, no one in Europe knows what to do about that. And Nader, is that, in other words, is there a specific Muslim question or issue with respect to Muslim migrant communities. This is a very different question from the question that many people are asking, which is, is Islam the problem or is there an Islamic issue? The sociological question is, is there a question, is there an issue, is there an obstacle specific to Muslim migrant communities living in Europe that yeah, prevents yeah. this process of assimilation, integration or what have yeah. you? You know, one of the interesting things that struck me in following the debate post Paris about the um, Muslim community in France was that there was this assumption that there is this five million monolithic Muslim community who all breathe, think, and behave right. in the exact same way. Vast numbers of the, um, first of all, there's no such thing as a Muslim community. There are Muslim communities. Some of them are from North Africa, some from Turkey. Many of them are second, uh, second, third generation. And many of them deeply assimilated. You know, some people may have a Muslim identity because their grandparents were Muslim, but they're not informed by any sort of Muslim practice and behavior. And if you look at the sociological studies, for example, there was a 2005 Sciences Po study in terms of measuring religious behavior and practice of people who had a Muslim identity in France and comparing it with other sort of uh, religious communities in France. And there was no sizable difference. The Even perception is, is that there's a vast difference, but they, the, the level of, uh, of you know, religious adherence. So there is, and I think the problem here is that there is recently a subgroup within the broader Muslim uh, communities, let's say in this case France, that have become radicalized. And, you know, social discrimination, economic issues is part of the problem that has created the conditions. But I think a big factor here is the, one, the point that I spoke to earlier, the question of the political theology of the ideas that have now become much more mainstream and accessible and that have been exacerbated by social media that have produced this particular phenomenon at this particular time. So I think the, the picture of Muslim communities is, uh, particularly in France, I think England is, a, is, is somewhat of a different case, is a much more nuanced and complex picture than this, you know, um, five million monolithic um, uh, Islamic fundamentalist community that they're all Al-Qaeda Al supporters. You know, as Olivier Roy, the great soci French sociologist, sort of said, let's just um, let's just have a um, you know, uh, we need some clarity on this issue. There are more Muslims in the French security forces than there are you know participating in these violent acts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of them was actually killed in the Charlie right. Hebdo massacre, right. a, a Muslim policeman. Ahmed Marabay. And by the way, just to find, I'm going to get to Alan in one second, just to um, underscore Nader's point, even the Kawashi brothers themselves considered themselves very bad Muslims. Um, they were not practicing Muslims for most of their lives. They were quite, um, if you will, secular or at least um, uh, non-practicing. And uh, they were actually, it was through a prison through their experience in prison, as is true in, in many countries, by the way, where people find religion. Um, the question is, what particular form of religion and, and, as you say, political theology did they find their way to? Alan? Well, maybe I just I would like to underline this point about how small the group that actually did this is. There were three people. There was a police officer, Ahmed Marabay, who was killed. There was a proofreader who was Muslim, who was of origin, who was killed. A proofreader and, on the staff of Charlie Hebdo. Right. And at the kosher supermarket, there was a Muslim worker who's now been made a French citizen who actually saved for the people from the butchery of innocence by these fanatics. The French government estimates that there are 621 people who have gone to Syria and Iraq. That reflects a larger number. To talk about the whole five million in this way would be crazy. And what Martin says is also right, that although there's racism in France, there's a lot of anti-racism. And the same is true in the United States. 
So I don't. And in think Germany, the Pe the Pegida rallies Germany, were met with larger anti-Pegida rallies. There are there's a large anti-racist movement, and I think, by the way, there's more anti-Nazism even in the former East Germany than Martin thinks. Um, but sorry, I had to add that. <laughs> I'm not saying into... they're all Nazis. <laughs> no, I think actually that it arose out of the smashing of the Nazis, and one should be very careful about even though there was a significant outburst of this, and you're right to try to explain it, saying that things are so much better in the West. Unless I'm mistaken, in the West, the whole judiciary was the judiciary that served under the Nazis, as the student movement brought out in the 1950s. So, uh, you know, I think these points are subtle, and there are a lot of aspects. To them. Let's move on to the next okay, question. Yeah, the question. Thank you. My name is Richard Hancock, and I'm a, a teaching assistant for Arabic at CU Denver. And uh, my question is, kind of towards the Muslim communities. And I think a big problem I'm seeing is failure to distinguish between Muslims, Islamists, and extremists. Right. And uh, I was wondering if this is kind of a general question, if somebody could shed light on that, please. I think Professor Hashimi has a few thoughts on that subject. Well, very quickly, um, um, you know, I would argue that the vast majority of Muslims um, um, are generally, at least for my parents' generation, are apolitical. They have no particular sort of strong, so they're just, they may be socially conservative, but they're not political. Islamists itself is the term that has often been used, but there's a spectrum. There's a great book that I use in my course by Muhammad Ayyub called The Many Faces of Political Islam. You have violent extremist elements who tend to get most of the news. You have mainstream elements who are willing to participate in political uh, election opportunity uh, structures and, and participate in elections. They're not vi non, they're not uh, particularly violent. They may be socially conservative, but they accept democratic elections and outcomes. And then there's you know a lot of people in between that those spectrums. So the conflating of you know the terms that you used um, is unfortunately the the narrative that you hear if you ch if you turn it to channel 42 on Comcast and watch Fox News. You know, these no-go zones and these, you know, embarrassing things that they had to apologize for. That's the, that's the narrative. But anyone who's familiar with, you know, the, the nuances and the realities on the ground has to make these distinctions if you, wanted to, if you want to be ever informed on the topic. But, you know, let me just follow up on that a little bit because um, I think going back before Charlie Hebdo, there was an event in this country on Bill Maher's show um, where Bill Maher and Sam Harris – squared off against Ben Affleck and Nicholas Kristof. And Sam Harris and, and Bill Maher were, were insistent on the point that, yes, numerically, the jihadis, those willing to engage in violent acts in the name of their interpretation of Islam, are small in number. They are a fringe element. However, this was the Harris-Maher argument, there is a rather significant swath of the Muslim population that doesn't, they don't engage in those acts, but they support them or they don't disagree with them. And Sam Harris had some very specific number. I don't remember what it was, but let me put it out there, not because I agree with it, but because a lot of people in Europe today are saying, um, okay, it's only a tiny fringe element that engages in these acts, but look at the protests all over the Islamic world against the new issue of Charlie Hebdo. So you had a massacre two weeks ago, um, and some Muslims are carrying signs saying, Je suis juif, in other words, in solidarity with the victims of this horrific crime at the kosher uh, grocery, grocery store, supermarket. On the other hand, you have massive rallies and demonstrations in Pakistan and other parts of the Islamic world against the new issue of Charlie Hebdo, some expressing sympathy for the Kawashi brothers, etc. So my point, Nader, is simply, yes, there are the numbers, and then there's the larger question of sympathies. I mean, just very quickly, um, um, there's an element of truth to what Sam, Sam Harris and Bill Maher are saying, in the sense that there is a civilizational fault line on the question of blasphemy, and on the question of whether it should be legitimate to mock sacred symbols and um, references. I think you know large parts of the non-Western world sort of believe that those things should be off limit when it comes to sort of freedom of expression. In the West, particularly in Europe, particularly in France, there's a sense that everything is fair game. So there is a tension there. But when you know Bill Maher are making these sort of broad generalizations that there's this critical mass of these um, uh, Muslims who are in favor of sort of violence, he's got to be very careful when it comes to making these gross generalizations because you can apply that same standard, let's say, to the United States. Um, after the torture report, 
public opinions in polls in this country revealed that the vast, the majority of Americans, over 50%, still support the use of torture against political prisoners. Rectal feeding of political prisoners after the release of the report. So what, what I can conjure up an argument that someone on the other side of the road will say, well, what's wrong with these Americans? What's wrong with these Christians? What's wrong with these values that are producing these high numbers of... So when the shoe's on the other foot, you sort of see how you know, reductive and, and, and fundamentally un, unhelpful these gross generalizations are uh, when they're advanced and they're claimed to be sort of, you know, uh, truths. It looks like Martin and Alan, <coughs> reading body language, would like to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not reading mine. Um, I, I'm sorry, I was occluded from your, my, my view mind. of your body, Micheline, was slightly but, blocked by Alan. But uh, I think, you know, Europe, Europe has had a long... Could move the microphone oh. closer, Martin, Europe has a long history of extremist, extremist and terrorism. Um, I mean, if you look back at the history of terrorism in France, more French people have been killed by the, action, the, the terrorism of groups like Action Direct, or the, the PFLP, which was you know, attacking Jewish, Jewish restaurants and so on in, in Paris, not on an Islamist agenda, obviously, but on an Israel-Palestinian. Or the Beider-Meinhof gang. And then if you include the connections between Action Direct in France and the, Bader Main, uh, the, the, the Red Army faction in Germany and uh, the uh, Red Brigades in Italy, you had a whole network of terrorists who were killing indiscriminately and who were killing in a targeted sense as well, usually out of sympathy with the Palestinian struggle. That didn't create the kind of moral panic that I think you're seeing now, whipped up to some extent by you know political parties that want to ex to exploit the issue, and so and 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 by the press that wants to kind of sensationalise it to some extent. But I think it goes back to what Nader was saying before. There's a there's an interesting there's a moment that makes this terrorism, even though it's smaller in terms of the casualties, at least in Europe, than previous terrorisms, that that connects it to a glo a, a set of global events. Right. That, that's, that's, right. the, that's the different thing. It's a, it's the extremists are small in number, but it's connected to these calamitous events that are occurring in the Middle East, and that's that's a whole new ball game. And I think it's that that partly explains the moral panic. And that's true on a symbolic level, but also in terms of global networks. Right. So the, a lot of these young uh, Muslims in Europe have, in fact, been to Syria, to Yemen. And, are in are, and, and in the right. case of the Kouashi brothers, were acting in the name of yeah. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Right. There was a connection with ISIS. That's not new either in the sense that left-wing terrorist groups in the 1970s and 1980s were often trained in groups in which there were PFLP and, and Abu Nidal terrorists working in unison to create a pan-European, pan stretching to the Middle East network. But it's of a different kind of order, I think, than the one we're in today. Okay, Alan, you can either quickly chime in or we can go to the next question and you can respond to that. What would you like to do? I'll go to the next question. Oh, okay. very good. Please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Mohammed. I'm a junior here at DU. Uh, my question was in, in particular to Alan, but uh, now there are Martin. Uh, so last year, uh, so two years ago, the Pew Research Center received a survey done in Muslim countries around the world. Um, and their findings were pretty troubling. And now that you mentioned that um, there were gross generalizations being made about the Muslim world, but some of the facts um, in Turkey, where uh, around 60 million Muslims live, uh, the survey showed that 15% of Turkish Muslims, which we consider a modern democratic state, believe that suicide bombings are often or sometimes justified. And 76% of Muslims in South Asia, where over a billion Muslims live, believe that those who leave the Islamic faith uh, should be executed. Um, so I think there's a broader uh, movement of uh, Islamism and religious fundamentalism that's going around, uh, going on in the world today. And I wanted to get everyone's opinion on self-censorship in the media when it comes to talking about these issues and any criticism of the doctrinal aspects of Islam is conflated with Islamophobia and what the consequences of those are to um, liberalism. Okay, the, actually that follows on the uh, tail of um, something that Nader and I discussed this morning, which is the, the prominent um, 
Muslim intellectual uh, Zia Sardar, the editor of the journal Critical Muslim, has a, an op-ed in today's Independent in London arguing that there is in fact a dearth of free-thinking voices in, in the contemporary Islamic world and that this is this internal discussion of the state of, is, of the Islamic world is missing in this debate about the current crisis. But Nader, did you want to respond? Yeah, to I mean, I, I sort of addressed this point again, but I'll sort of re rephrase it. There is a crisis of ideas uh, within the Muslim world writ large, no doubt about it. Um, but I don't think um, we should be surprised that these very uh, extreme um, acts of ugliness are coming out of the, um, the Muslim world, largely the Arab Islamic world. Because if you look at the social conditions that have been existing there and have gotten worse, I would argue, with every decade, those social conditions are ones that would, you know, you would, you would, you would assume, you would predict, would produce these types of ug acts of ugliness and sort of retrograde and very sort of violent ideas. Um, you can't, you know, s expect a part of the world that has been, at least since World War II, been deeply shaped and scarred by the persistence of um, political tyranny, despotism, and the absence of democratic openings to produce sort of liberal democratic ideas and, and, and tolerant ideas. Um, so you mentioned the question of 15% in Turkey. That's pretty low. 50% of Americans support the use of torture after the release of this uh, torture report and, and, and large public debate. So 15% is pretty small. I mean, you can go to almost any community and sort of do an, a, a poll and find some sort of pretty scary views. And, and Turkey, you know, as we know from recent events, is an emerging democracy. And it's a democracy that is, you know, facing a major crisis now with the current, current president. So um, I don't see that figure in and of itself as being troubling. But I think the, the, the bigger point here is that the, um, the, the political and social conditions that have faced and that have shaped the Arab Islamic world, which are as a result of, you know, a number of factors, ruling elites and their repressive rule. But also, I think we have to be honest here, the role that Western policy and U.S. policy has played in some countries more, some countries less, has produced those social conditions. So when we talk about Saudi Arabia and the question of Wahhabism, you know, we can't ignore the very tight embrace and relationship between the United States and, and, and Saudi Arabia. It reminds me of this, you know, famous article that was written by the prominent Moroccan sociologist Fatima Renisi uh, in 1996, where she, where she talked about the relationship between palace fundamentalism and uh, liberal democracy, particularly liberal democratic states that have, you know, no problem with certain forms of fundamentalism if they, you know, advance uh, economic interests. So th that has to be part of the conversation as well. Tom and then Alan. I think, I think it's a fair generalization to say that communities, whether they be national communities or subnational communities, that feel under stress are much less likely to be open, liberal, and progressive than communities that don't feel under stress or feel in, that they're dominant or that, that they're successful. I think of the history of the United States, for example, and when we've had the most serious general violations of civil liberties and civil rights. Uh, we had them immediately after the First World War and during and after the First World War when this was right after the Bolshevik Revolution and there was a Red Scare and thousands of people were picked up by the Federal Security Services and imprisoned on the basis of association or speech uh, in the McCarthy era well, at the beginning of the Cold War, at the end of the Second World War, there were serious restrictions. Professors, God forbid, were actually forced out of universities. Uh, or take a country, take country, a country like uh, Cuba. Uh, I think that one of the reasons that the Castro brothers have been able to maintain their grip on Cuba for all these decades has been in part because they have successfully sold the narrative of a country about to be invaded at any time. So this is this this then leads to a point about the not the entire Islamic world, because the Islamic world, after all, includes very successful countries like Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, but the swath of the Islamic world from the Maghreb to the subcontinent, so I'm including Bangladesh and Pakistan, uh, this part of the world has actually been 
under uh, foreign domination and, inter and, and intervention for the past two centuries. And even where independent states have emerged, and most of the area they are independent states, they haven't been very successful states in terms of there are no South Koreas, there are no Taiwans, there are no Malaysias. There are not, there are not a lot of examples of, of economically dynamic uh, democracy consolidating <laughs> kinds of regimes. And there is a very large Western presence in these, in these areas, which takes either violent or openly violent forms or more subtly violent forms, that is, we have assisted uh, unsuccessful authoritarian governments in these areas. So it's quite the, the jihadi narrative of being on the defensive, of, of Islamic communities defending themselves against attack, has just enough substance in it to make it not entirely easy to rebut. And we, we do have a struggle of narratives going on here. Alan? Um, I think placing ourselves totally inside the framework of the Muslim problem and such things is a mistake. That's not to say there aren't serious problems the sort not are mentioned. But take Baruch Goldstein from Brooklyn who walked into a mosque and murdered 29 people. Is it really the case that anti-Semitism of the standard forms, including on the left, is justified because that happens? Is that really a leap you'd like to make? If Anders Breivik goes and kills 80 people because he's a fundamentalist Christian who wants to fight the Crusades and is a Knight Templar. You're talking about the perpetrator of the Norwegian Nor yeah, right. massacre. Yes. Are we really to say that all Christians, including Martin Luther King, we just celebrated, are thugs? Right? Now, you'll excuse me, there were three guys who did these horrors. There are millions of people in France who do not do these horrors who are Arabs. Why the hell are we having a debate in which John Boehner this morning can talk about the horrors in France, and he means go after Iran, who are Shiites, not Sunnis. And what the hell? This is all over the Denver Post, and it will be all, we will get Mr. Netanyahu, who is really not a liberal, right, and wanted to get Jews to get out of France. That's why he went there, which I think he and Le Pen actually have some agreement on that. I find it disgusting. If we want to defend liberal values, we have to challenge racism. And the fact is that the prophet talks a lot about Abraham, Abraham, right? It's a monotheistic religion that comes out of Judo-Christianity in that sequence. And the idea that we have to go kill Muslims and invade the Middle East and we spend the largest amount of money in the world on arms, and we armed the teeth, most of these tyrannies in the Middle East, and we overthrew the Iranian democracy 50 years ago. The idea that the United States of America and its form of public liberalism is a friend of democracy needs to be established in the Middle East. Somebody who's skeptical of that is just looking at the facts. Now, Alan, I, I hear what you're saying about how the debate in the West, um, you feel, should not be about the internal problems of the Islamic world. And of but course, can you in Islam, yes, it should, and I agree with that point. Well, that was what I was going to say. Surely you understand why liberal Muslims who fight for pluralism and tolerant interpretations of Islam and democratic visions of the Muslim world would want to engage in debate and struggle against the dark, the dark forces of repression and authoritarianism within Islam, specifically, as Nader was talking about, the more Wahhabi-inspired, intolerant interpretations of Islam that are gaining ground and are spreading globally through this network. Um, so there is a debate within the Islamic world and a con contestation between different visions of an Islamic future. Decent, intelligent, uh, 
wanting to fight corrupt people in the Islamic world should obviously be honored. Let's take one last question. Habib. I'm from Afghanistan. Can you speak uh, right into the microphone, Habib? Uh, I'm a second-year MA student at Korbel. Um, I just wanted to know why, when it comes to terrorism, um, especially Islamic terrorism, we always look at it from a Western security prism. We don't look at it from a human rights uh, prism. Uh, on the same day or the day before the Charlie Abdo attack, 2,000 Nigerians were killed. They were Muslims. And 97% of the victims of Islamic terrorism are Muslims. Uh, why not look at it f from a human rights point of view? My second question is that in 2011, President Obama sent a specific letter to the president of Yemen to put in jail the Al Jazeera uh, uh, journalist who was reporting on the drone strikes that was killing a lot of civilians. If Western countries, especially United States, big countries who are going to Middle East and invade countries, are killing journalists, violating uh, the, the right of uh, freedom of speech, why should we uh, th take them and the terrorists who attacked Charlie Abdo in two different levels of morality. Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, two questions, in fact. Would, who would like to respond on our panel? Habib, did you have anyone in particular in mind? Martin? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, it, again, it's a hugely contradictory situation. I think the, the Western media um, sensationalizes the kinds of attacks that happened at Charlie Abdo, but do not sense or, or do not proclaim with the same kind of you know whipping up the same kind of moral panic if you like about the attacks on Muslims in other parts of the world. I mean, it's, Islamic extreme, extremism is killing thousands and thousands of people all the time in other parts of the world, in Nigeria, in in uh, Pakistan, in Pakistan, in the, in, in the Middle East, and but and I think that does to the extent that it does get media attention, it, it's obviously disproportionate to the to the attention given to a small number of people who are killed in France. On the other hand, I think the in terms of in terms of public opinion and, and, and the role of the media in shaping it, reporting on those other um, crimes against humanity and against human rights in those other other countries unfortunately also reinforces the anti-Islamism of, and in, in this case uh, we're talking about Europe, anti-Islamist political parties and movements, saying, well, you know, they, they do this in France, but, you know, you go, look at what they're doing elsewhere. It's even worse. You know, that, you know, and they're coming here. And they're coming here. So, so it, it, I, I, there's a quandary, isn't there? I mean, public opinion is, is formed by... Uh, events in the media, and unfortunately, events in the media coverage of them is is reinforcing a very negative impression of Islam. And the second, but the second point you make about you know relative um, moral claims on behalf of you know, some some countries covering up their own immoral actions versus the immoral or anti-human rights actions of of, of, of of other groups is is clearly. Uh, hip hypocrisy, as you as you suggest, Micheline. Yes, I, I like very much your question. I'm uh, with uh, the sort of the filters of security versus human rights, and and I would like to expand on that just so briefly. Uh, it, it seems to me that when we talk about security strategy to any hill or, or problems, such as the one we have seen, the first reaction is to be quick, fast invest in the military, invest in the police, invest in surveillance. And in fact, there is what happened in France just recently is just really refocusing on that part of that strategy. It is no long-term strategy at all. You want to sustain the status quo. It's a very conservative position. Here I'm giving a bit of a caricature of a security lens, as I'm sure that others in the audience might think otherwise. But if you take a more human rights perspective of a particular 
hill, social ill or social problems, you would not want to erect bar barriers or boundaries between the European <coughs> country. That would be not the most effective way of thinking about it. It would sort of like betray the Schengen's agreement and so forth. You would want to really look at the social causes that leads to certain particular problem. How do you uh, create a certain form of integration, economic, social integrations, for those who have not succeeded in assimilated uh, among the, 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 the Muslim populations. And I agree with, with Martin, there are many who have succeeded in integrating and assimilating. <coughs> so it's a, a more preventive approach, <coughs> focusing on social causes that would be so much more illuminating that just a, a pure, immediate, strategic, surgical way of, of thinking about the problem. And I think that's part of the discourse that needs to be high, heightened or enlightened. I mean, we should be enlightened more by that part of the discourse if we're thinking long-term strategy to overcome some of those, the fanaticism, uh, whether it's in minority or in significant minority or, or, or more than that. But I think that that's the, the place where we should re, we focus our attention. So thank you for bringing this question. I think. And yeah. I'd like to hear, okay, Nader, just, and just, I definitely want to hear from Tom on yeah, this. Just very quickly, I think the answer to your question is quite simple. People, communities, groups tend to respond much more passionately um, about events that they have something in common with, as opposed to events that they don't have um, something in common. So, for example, in the case of Paris, Western civilizations, the United States, you know, they could identify culturally, historically with what happened in France, less so with other cultural communities. Uh, and the same exists within the Muslim world. Muslims are very passionate, very angry, very agitated when Palestinians uh, are killed and, and when Bosnians are killed um, because of the common cultural sort of connections that they have. Now, having said that, I think the human rights groups in the West, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, they do a good job across the board generally speaking, with few exceptions. They report consistently and critically over human rights violations, and they don't tend to make those distinctions. But you did say something that was quite shocking. I don't know if anyone else picked up on it. This is the first time that I've heard that President Obama sent a letter to the head of a foreign state asking them to arrest a journalist because they're reporting on drone strikes. Has anyone else heard that? Uh, Send me the email. <laughs> Yeah. Send me the email. I'd like to see it. Thanks. Now, Tom, I'd like to hear from you on this because in our correspondence before this uh, forum today, you, you emphasize, you're, you're kind of high and low on this, Tom, which is to say you've written this very philosophical, high-altitude theoretical reflection on the questions of liberalism and the limits of tolerance and so forth. But you're also very, very interested in what specific policies could help resolve this situation. So if you could give us some of your thoughts on that before we leave here today, I think that would be helpful. Well, fractions of a thought, perhaps. <laughs> uh, in the case, in the case of of Europe, not just France, on the problem of social isolation, which everyone has referred to at one time or another. Uh, European economies are stagnant, and the prospects for European economies are not very good. So I, I've always had the view that when, the, when a non-petro state is growing seven or eight percent a year, you don't have to worry very much about internal conflict. Somehow sectarian problems don't assume the politicized form that they do in stagnant, economically stagnant countries. The collapse of, of, the, of Yugoslavia into fratricidal strife began at a time when the, Europe, when the Yugoslavian economy was contracting at a radical rate. So, I worry about Europe in part because we don't see an end. We don't see at least a, a rebirth of rapid economic growth. When the first generation of immigrants after World War II came to Europe, Europe was economically dynamic, and now it is stagnant. So what, what are the prospects? What, what can the state do? to decrease social isolation. And one thing that has occurred to me is through comprehensive national service, not everybody serving in the military or the police, but some form of national service where different classes 
uh, were consciously integrated into small groups performing different kinds of public services. I think that that's the, the only one practical idea that has occurred to me, which is likely to address this, this social isolation that exists. The uh, other point I, I, I'd, I'd like to make is, I, and this is an hypothesis, that the distinction between soft targets and hard targets, terrorism is supposed to be a tax on soft targets, on, on civilians. Uh, is that distinction, which has become, in recent years, really quite recent years, become quite strong, particularly in the West, is that breaking down? Uh, during the Korean War, toward the latter stages of the Korean War, uh, the American Air Force general, who was in charge of the air war, said, there's nothing left to bomb all we're doing is making the rubble jump. In other words, we had carpet bombed North Korea. But in the years since then, since then, a sense of restraint on the use of force, a very clear distinction has, has been attempted to be drawn between attacking military targets and attacking civilians. And that's really the basis of the concern about terrorism. It's an attack on civilians on the innocent, as it were. But if, if you are engaging in large-scale warfare primarily by attacking from the air, whether it's by drones or missiles or what have you, and whether it's the US or the French or the Israelis, then isn't, and many civilians are killed, then isn't there a tendency for the distinction between hard and soft targets to break down? Because although our position would be that, well, these, this is collateral damage. We don't intend to kill all these people. We know that they'll die, but we don't intend it, and therefore it's legitimate. But the persons in, who are at the other end of it, or who identify with the people who are at the other end of these attacks, uh, they may say, but you know you're going to kill them, and therefore, what's the difference between my, p I don't have the high technology, I only have the suicide bomb, or I have the bomb, I have the bomb. You can do it from the air, but what's the difference? You know you're killing people, we know you're, we're killing people, we're both acting out of political motives. What's the difference? And so, Again, we have this struggle of narratives, and I'm worrying that the, the narrative that we emphasize, which is the narrative of the insulation of soft targets of the, quote, innocent from attack, may be breaking down in part through our own actions. Those actions still may be expedient. That's another debate. But they may have this incidental consequence. Friends, it is now just about 2 o'clock. I think you'll agree with me that this has been a really robust and spirited discussion that has left us with plenty to chew on and continue to think about. Um, I want to give one last plug for the resource page that we've now posted on our Center for Middle East Studies website that has links to some of the most thoughtful essays and think pieces. Nader and I are even toying with the idea of collecting them into some sort of book about the Charlie Hebdo debate. Um, whether we do that or not, I'm very, very pleased to have collaborated with the Center for the Study of Europe and the World today on this very, I think, stimulating panel discussion. Thanks for being here.